last of the gunpowder empires with the Mughal Empire of India. Um, this has a connection to the very first video. If you remember, we were talking about Tamerlane or Timur, a Mongol descendant who had a brief empire uh, that um, does decline fairly briefly, but one of his descendants, Babur, um, founds the Mughal Empire. So again, we see that the Mughals are also made up from Turkish or origin. Um, Mughal actually is translated from Mongol, so there's a clear connection there to the, to the steppe peoples of Central Asia. Um, so uh, the Mughal Empire lasted about 300 years. Um, it was founded in the 1520s. Um, so it doesn't last nearly as long as the Ottoman Empire, but it is a little bit longer lasting mm -hmm. than the Safavid Empire. Um, they take advantage of the fact that the, it's very decentralized, fairly chaotic um, in India um, when the Mughal dynasty is established. Remember that the Mughals were Muslim and the majority of the population in India at that point was Hindu. Um, uh, Babur also and the rest of the Mughal Empire completed some conquests in northern India. Um, and as time goes on, some of the descendants of the original Mughal empires are going to add additional territory onto, the, onto their empire. And at its height, the Mughal empire represents almost the entire Indian subcontinent. Um, so you see here it is under Babur, and you see Akbar adds quite a bit of territory to it, and Aurangzeb, despite the fact that he's not nearly as popular, also is responsible for a lot of additions. Um, but we'll also see that Aurangzeb makes many mistakes in his rule that contributes to the decline of the empire. Um, but in any case, um, let's talk about the subsequent rulers. Um, Akbar, um, also known as Akbar the Great. He was a very capable and powerful Mughal ruler. Um, he um, was responsible for major expansion of the Mughal dynasty. So again, we see these are all the territorial acquisitions that were added to the Mughal Empire when Akbar was in control. He also established a much more efficient and centralized government. Um, and uh, made sure that laws were fairly fairly administered. Um, the center of government was located at the capital city of Delhi, um, and uh, he was seen as a very fair ruler also because all of his people had the right to appeal to him for final judgment in a lawsuit. So he was definitely seen as a um, as a very strong example of a fair um, and equitable ruler. Think about Suleiman's uh, reputation as the lawgiver. That's a good uh, area to compare. Akbar's government um, was similar in a lot of ways to the Ottoman system. Um, first off, Akbar became quite famous. It was very well known that he was a capable and fair leader. And so because of his good reputation, he recruited men from throughout Central Asia to serve in his bureaucracy. He also had a very effective civil service uh, system, and the bureaucracy, um, or the bureaucrats rather, were called zamindars. Um, they had a variety of duties for the government. Um, they could collect taxes like many bureaucrats did. They also could supervise construction projects. They could make sure that irrigation um, programs effectively uh, directed water into urban areas. And zamindars were paid actually through land grants instead of salaries. Um, but they were able, like many bureaucrats were, to keep a portion of taxes that they collected from local peasants. Um, and they also could collect, um, and also um, the peasants contributed uh, about one third of all of their produce to the government. So you could see that um, the, uh, the, um, central nature of the government was in many ways subsidized by the peasants um, since they paid taxes um, and since they also gave food directly to the government. Um, so this bureaucratic system worked pretty well under Akbar, but subsequent rulers were not as strong. We're going to see that the zamindars become increasingly corrupt as time goes on. They're going to keep more of the taxes that they collected, uh, a similar pattern in many bureaucratic places. 
Um, and they g gain enough money that they start to recruit and build their own personal armies of soldiers that are more loyal to them than they are to the Mughal government. So um, when you have more corrupt leaders come about, you're going to see that that uh, contributes to the decline of the central government in the Mughal Empire. Um, but the Zamindars do represent continuity and change because the Zamindar system of bureaucracy actually still exists um, when the British take over India during the age of imperialism. And so um, you see that they still use um, uh, local bureaucrats to work for the government, even when, uh, even when it's ruled by outsiders. Um, Akbar, another comparison to the Ottoman Empire, um, was very religiously tolerant. Um, so uh, again, remember that despite the fact that the Mughals were uh, Muslim, um, most of the people who lived in the Mughal Empire were Hindu. And so in order to effectively rule the government, they, they knew that they had to treat these people with, with tolerance and respect. Um, so they actually allocated grants of money or land uh, to Hindus, um, and they also accepted Christians. Um, Akbar gave money uh, to build a Catholic church in Goa, which was a city on the southwest coast of India. Um, and Akbar also um, was supportive to a new-ish religious group called Sikhs, which uh, incorporated some Hindu and some uh, Muslim traditions. Uh, and also, um, you'll see that, um, that he was religiously tolerant in terms of in terms of his own personal life, he actually, uh, he had many wives, and some of them were Hindu. Um, he also had no problem with um, hiring Hindus to work in the government. So you had Zamindars, who actually were Hindu, and they made up both low and high positions uh, in the government. So uh, there was, you know, they, they weren't restrictive in terms of who would actually uh, uh, work for the bureaucracy. Um, and also, and this is one major difference, or it kind of shows you that during Akbar's time, you could make the argument that uh, they were even more religiously tolerant than the Ottomans because uh, the Hindus actually did not have to pay a poll tax when Akbar was in control. Now, this will not last forever. We will see that some of the future Mughal emperors are not as tolerant. Um, but nonetheless, this is one of the reasons why the empire is able to flourish in its early days. Um, and also, Akbar was very interested in learning about Christianity. He um, invited Roman Catholic princes to Delhi to explain it to him. And, and this artistic uh, rendering here is of Akbar actually meeting with uh, Jesuits. Um, okay, Akbar also, uh, because he was seen as such a strong and outstanding ruler, uh, he also helped uh, culture flourish in the Mughal Empire. Um, he very much encouraged the growth of art, architecture, and the development of literature. Um, you're going to see glorious citadels uh, be built uh, throughout the empire, especially in the major cities. They symbolize the prestige and power and central nature of the government. Um, and also wealthy citizens were very interested in the pro proliferation of the arts. So very much like in the uh, Renaissance, for example, many wealthy people acted as patrons to the arts. Um, you even had the acceptance of Christian art uh, throughout the Mughal Empire. So Akbar actually had a nativity scene. This I don't know if this is Akbar's actual nativity scene, but this was a Muslim portrayal of the nativity here. Um, so um, Akbar actually had a nativity scene that he had in his private chamber. Um, other elements of culture represent more uh, continuity from the past. Uh, we do see that um, there are some long-standing Hindu traditions that Akbar tries to change, uh, but has limited success. One of them is a practice called sati, which shows the uh, very sort of inferior position of women in, uh, in these more ancient Hindu cultures. Sati was where a widowed woman uh, would throw herself on the funeral pyre of her dead husband, so basically committing suicide. Um, so it obviously shows that women had little independence or authority. Um, so Akbar tries to get rid of that, but that tradition was so strong that he sort of tried in vain to do that. Additionally, he tried to uh, abolish child marriage, but that also had long-standing traditions, so he had limited success. So again, there is some continuity in, in the culture in the sense that he can't, of course, uh, rid some of the uh, more problematic uh, traditions that existed when he inherited or when he gained this land. One of the things that Akbar tries to do is he uh, really tries to have a positive relationship between Muslims and Hindus. He actually tries to create his own religion, which was a blend of Muslim and Hindu. It was called Din-e-Islam, uh, 
Ilahi, um, which translates into divine faith. Basically, the purpose of the religion was to reconcile Hinduism and, uh, and Islam, but um, it doesn't really catch on. Uh, and so by the time Akbar dies in 1605, he doesn't really successfully convert that many Hindus or Muslims to this new faith. And, and because of that, and because some of the subsequent rulers of the Mughal Empire are less tolerant, we will see... Uh, we will see the empire start to decline in terms of the success of religious tolerance. Um, nonetheless, when Akbar ruled, the economy also was very strong. Uh, under Akbar, it was one of the richest and best governed states in the entire world. Um, it experienced a flourishing of overseas trade. And it was also a relatively peaceful period in a militaristic sense, which obviously helped trade. Um, commerce actually was largely carried out by outsiders. Um, the Mughal Indians did not particularly care for trading by sea on the Indian Ocean, so you had Arab seafaring traders do it instead. Um, and uh, some of the major trade goods that they exported were things like textiles, uh, tropical food items, spices, and precious stones. And all of these things were actually traded for gold and silver, which indicates to us that the uh, Mughals were actually way more interested in exporting their fine goods and not so much importing goods from outside places. So you could compare that actually to the Chinese during the Ming Dynasty, for example, where they're much more interested in actually sort of showing off the wealth that they can produce internally. Um, so it shows you that really the, the strength of the Mughal Empire shows you how diverse their economy was, um, and it shows you why there's such a foreign interest in it, why Western European countries have such a desire to reach uh, these places, uh, to benefit from trade with them. Um, because uh, there is also significant trade within the borders of the empire, uh, there is going to be a, a merchant caste that's going to grow in status. Um, and merchants also were permitted to participate in the banking uh, industry as well as produce handicrafts. So the merchants will grow in, in status uh, during Akbar's rule. Um, and then the next powerful ruler uh, of the Mughal Empire was named Shah Jahan. Um, this also uh, really shows how strong the economy is and how strong the arts and architecture was um, during Shah Jahan's rule. It's still flourishing at this point. Uh, many people see Shah Jahan's rule as the golden age of, uh, of the Mughal Empire. Um, one of the most significant architectural contributions was the building of the Taj Mahal, one of the most iconic buildings in all of India still. Um, he actually built this as a tomb for his wife. It gives you a sense of uh, really the pinnacle of architectural achievements in the Mughal Empire. Um, and also during Shah Jahan's rule, Mughals um, worked to really beautify the city of Delhi, build more forts that showed the military strength of the city. Um, and you also just in general saw craftsmen and builders really um, champion the arts of Islam, uh, beautiful calligraphy, manuscripts, ceramic works, um, very beautiful architectural structures that, that demonstrate their mastering of, of geometry, for example, uh, just really gives you a sense that, that in, in this day we really are reaching a, a powerful, prominent uh, um, time of achievement for these Middle Eastern empires that often is sold short because the emphasis in history tends so much to be on Western places. Um, however, all, things must, uh, all good things must come to an end, as we know, so... Um, so Shah Jahan was powerful, but the, his uh, son and successor, Aurangzeb, um, makes many poor decisions that eventually contribute to the crumbling of the Mughal Empire. And so Aurangzeb, first, when he inherits the empire, um, he is unable to keep up with some of the military in, um, innovations that are uh, increasingly developing an external empire. So at this point, you're going to see that there's going to be um, improvements in Western European military technologies, for example, and, and Aurangzeb is unable to really keep up with that progress. Um, Aurangzeb continues to try to expand the empire, so he tries to push even farther south. He is somewhat successful in gaining additional territories, but he spends a lot of money doing it, and so uh, he sort of drains the uh, emperor's empire's treasury and uh, then, subsequently, he's unable to put down a lot of peasant uprisings that take place in the eras that he conquers. And also, one of the major problems with the Rongzeb's rule is that he wasn't particularly religiously tolerant. When he continues to try to expand uh, the Mughal Empire, he also tries to rid the Hindu influences of, of these areas. 
And so since he's doing this, he's spending a lot of money to try to expand the empire. And because he doesn't really particularly care for Hindus, um, there are going to be a lot of rebellions that take place. Uh, and uh, we'll see that Aurangzeb basically is not able to keep them down because he doesn't have enough money. Um, when Aurangzeb dies, uh, there's going to be even more instability that exists in the Mughal Empire. And essentially, as time goes on, this instability is going to lead to increasing European control over the region. And as we know, once we get to the uh, 19th century, the British and French are going to have most of the economic power in India. And of course, uh, in the 17th century, the British East India Company sets up several trading posts in India. And um, by the 19th century, the British establish a major colony in India, which really marks uh, the British domination of, of uh, so much of the world in the age of imperialism. So just uh, drawing everything together, sort of putting, uh, just sort of considering how all of the gunpowder empires um, from the Middle East decline. Um, one of the major reasons is that all of them are getting outside pressure from European trading companies. Of course, um, when these empires, especially the Ottomans, reach their height, this is a significant challenge to European supremacy over trade routes, for example. And so the Europeans find alternate routes. Uh, so, for example, of course, all the explorers like Vasco da Gama find sea routes um, to various places in, um, in the east. And eventually, since they established so many trade posts throughout uh, these throughout these places, um, and of course they develop increased naval technology, eventually they're going to be able to exert uh, more pressure, more military pressure. And, and um, as these empires get weaker, Europe is going to have a greater influence over the region. Um, also, of course, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of problems with uh, political succession um, in the Ottoman Empire. For example, harem politics oftentimes contributes to a lot of corruption um, in terms of just figuring out who the next ruler will be. Um, you also often saw a lot of just uh, internal conflict with families in terms of establishing legitimate rulers. Um, Aurangzeb is a good example. He actually killed all of his brothers in order to seize the throne. Um, so that definitely shows a lot of corruption in terms of royal succession. Um, and also we'll see that European military technology is continuing to proliferate, whereas uh, these gunpowder empires do not really keep up uh, these, uh, these militaries, so that their technology starts to become antiquated over time. Um, since uh, corrupt leadership also contributes to a weaker economy, we'll see that empires are unable to keep up such expensive armies. Um, they continue to impose taxes on peasants to try to make up for the deficits in their economies, which is going to lead to more peasant rebellions. Um, and also, we'll see it as time goes on, um, the Ottomans and the Mughals in particular, they decline in terms of their religious tolerance, which again leads to a lot of tension within their empires. And um, the major religious uh, division between the Hindus and Muslims in the Mughal Empire shows us um, shows us definitely how the Mughal Empire declines, um, and then ultimately the Ottomans are going to be less willing to accept outsiders like Jews and Christians into their empire. And then, of course, the Safavid Empire was never particularly religiously tolerant, um, which is one of the reasons why it was very short-lived. So this was all of the videos on the gunpowder empires. Hopefully uh, these give us a good overview. We have one more day in class where we can talk about uh, any questions, problems, concerns that we have with this. And then we will have a take-home test due early next week. So uh, I will see you uh, on Monday. Thanks for watching.